Hello, welcome back. My name is Jennifer Lynn Becker and I'm hosting the Five O'Clock Club today for the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show. Um, we will be looking at the process, um, at some of the materials I use in the watercolor botanical paintings that I do. Um, there's quite a bit of research that goes into each piece that I produce, so I'll discuss some of that. Um, and then talk about some of the materials. <laughs> Hello. Um, so I would first like to thank the Rittenhouse, Rittenhouse Fine Art Show organization for granting me this opportunity. Um, I have not yet participated in the show um, due to, you know, circumstances beyond everyone's control. <laughs> I have been invited twice. Um, and I'm looking forward to, I think the third time will be the charm. Um, but in that time, since I've been um, interacting with a few of the board members who are also artists and a couple of the other artists that participate, all of the interactions I've had have been just overwhelmingly positive. So I'm really pleased to be a part of this. Um, so thank you. So I guess I can just sort of jump into this. I'm just going to nerd out for a while, so just hang on. <laughs> um, basically, I will start with uh, talking about the pigments that I use. That's pretty much where my, my process starts. I started researching my paints and pastels for my artwork. I think around 2009, I started taking an interest in it. Um, did a lot of research and learned a lot about pigments in, throughout history. Um, and developed an interest in actually foraging some of my own pigments um, out in the wild. So like earth pigments, like ochres and hematite and things like this. Um, I started going out and just looking for them, see if I could find some. I was living in Texas at the time, and I found quite a bit, <laughs> actually. So back here, I'll show you up close. I've got shelves filled with pigments that I've been collecting. I think I actually started collecting around 2014, so I've got quite a bit of material. Um, and so now that I live in Pennsylvania, I just recently, well, five years ago, I moved here. Um, I have started to go out and forage for pigments around this region, South Central Pennsylvania, um, and have found amazing, I mean, there's just amazing colors out in nature. Like if you start looking around at the ground and, you know, if you drive through road cuts and you see the strata of for the different rock formations, there's just gorgeous colors in the rocks all over the place. Um, and I'm just, I'm in love with the color of the earth, basically. <laughs> so, um, so essentially I, let's see, I guess I can take you over and show you. I'll flip this around. So over here, um, we are currently in my watercolor studio. This is actually an 80 year old farmhouse that I live in that I have pretty much repurposed um, every room in this house to suit my needs. So this was, I think, a dining area. It's now my watercolor studio because I need quite a large space to do my paintings, which tend to get pretty big. Um, so, is that backwards? I can't tell. Anyway, so over here, this is kind of where I kind of do all the crazy stuff with the pigments. Um, so essentially, I, I kind of go on drives and, you know, kind of get lost out in the world and find rocks that look interesting. Like here are a couple of pieces of hematite, which is a particular rock that I am absolutely in love with. Um, sometimes I'll find some brightly colored like ochres or just pure iron ore. Um, Pretty much anything is fair game if it looks like it might, I might be able to recover a strong uh, pigment and quite a bit of it. Sometimes uh, the color of the rock can fool you and you're not quite sure what you'll get. But I like the surprises. I need some water. So anyway, um, I find these rocks and then I pound them up. So I've got a collection of mortar and pestles all different sizes. This is the biggest one I have, although there's a bigger one that I would love to get someday. Um, I smash up the rocks in one of these and I ground them down into a pretty fine powder. 
small as I can get, and then I sift it into a jar of water like this. And I, I do what's called levigating the pigment. So I'll, I'll drop the pigment into a jar of water and then agitate it so that the finer pigment particles kind of get suspended in the water. And then after about 30 seconds, um, I'll pour off whatever is suspended in the water into a shallow dish. And so depending on what type of pigment I'm working with, um, the ochres tend to be a bit heavier and larger grain, so they'll settle to the bottom of the dish pretty quickly. Um, hematite can, can develop a very fine powder that can remain suspended in the water for a few days, so sometimes I have to leave the dish sitting for a while. Um, but I wait until the pigment settles to the bottom of the dish, and then I get what looks like this, and then I can just scrape it up. And so there's some, some pigment right there. And I'll pound it up again, and usually I use the ceramic mortar and pestle. Um, pound it up until it's, you know, in a really fine powder, as fine as I can get it. And then I store it in a jar. So basically this is the collection I have of processed pigments. I have <laughs> boxes of rocks, like like too many of them. I've just been collecting. I, I generally scout um, and I will collect a small sample. So I don't like to take what I won't use. Um, so usually I'll go scout, I'll pick up a few samples of something that looks usable. And then I'll do a test and make sure it produces um, a really nice pigment. And if it does, I'll go back out and collect some more, you know, but I, I try to be pretty frugal with, with what I'm doing. So, um, basically what I have here, the middle two shelves, you can see on the bottom shelf, I've actually got, those are purchased powdered pigments. Um, the two center shelves here are all colors that I collected while I was living in Texas. So I was in Austin and I used to make trips pretty much all around the Austin area. Um, there's some pretty amazing ochre deposits out there. And there's an incredible region called the Llano Uplift, which is one of the most geologically amazing regions, I think, in the world. It's just so rich. There's so much to see there. Um, and hang on, let me check the comments. Shelf life on dried pigments. You know, so, they, so this is one of the reasons that I wanted to start doing this. Um, what motivated me uh, initially when I started researching the pigments I was using uh, in the mid-2000s was I learned that a lot of pigments that are um, sold to artists aren't stable. So a lot of them, I know a lot of people know, you know, about the light fast ratings. Um, a lot of pigments like the lakes and the carmines and things like that are, will not hold their color over time. So I did research into, well, okay, which pigments will hold their color over time because I'm, I'm interested in the longevity of my work. Um, and so these natural earth pigments, anything that's like an iron oxide um, or like a green sand, anything that you recover from rocks will pretty much last for thousands of years. So like the old cave paintings that you see from like 40,000 years ago, those are like these colors, like these ochres. That's what they were using. So they'll last, you know, for thousands of years. <laughs> um, and in the sunlight, you know, these rocks don't lose their, their color if they're being baked by the sun. It's, it's, the, it's one of the features of iron. It's really nice. So these will all be stable, and that's seriously, like, one of the primary reasons that I wanted to do this. I, I just want to make sure that what I'm using in my work will, will, will be that way, you know, for, like, centuries. <laughs> So anyway, um, so yeah, so these shelves up here, these are all materials that I collected from Texas, and I got some really beautiful, you know, like yellow and orange ochres. These were all um, easy to recover because they were sort of like in a sandy matrix, so they were easy to kind of break down and just pull the pigment out with water. I was super fortunate to get this gorgeous violet. It's kind of hard to see in this lighting, but this is an actual violet ochre. Those are tough to find. Um, and I found some green sand deposits, so I got a really lovely natural earth green um, while I was there. And then Pennsylvania, so I'll, I'll be able to show these colors a little bit better on 
a sheet of paper. But the colors I'm getting from Pennsylvania are all being recovered from shale and slate, because there are so many different colors of, of that particular stone. And I'm getting these really lovely, subtle hues. Uh, so they're like hues of gray. So there's like a, a, a rose-tinted gray, a green-tinted gray, some yellows. Um, and I did actually get oh, the hematites on the table. I'll show you that one in a minute. I have found some really nice softer hematites that um, are yielding this gorgeous violet brown color. So I was excited about that. Um, so that's basically where I am with the Pennsylvania colors. I've really only just started doing Pennsylvania over the past year. And then so I have these purchase pigments that initially I picked up just to do comparisons. For what I was collecting, I wanted to compare against what you could get from deposits in other countries. Some of these are from France, Italy, um, some from this country. Uh, and I do actually use the synthetics like the ultramarine, um, viridian, things like that, because you can't really get colors like that in nature that are stable. You can get them from dyes, like uh, from plant material or organic material, but they will not retain their color over time. So I avoid all organic pigments in my work. Um, so, so anyway, so scrape up the, the stuff at the bottom of the dish and you've got your pigment. And so this is, <laughs> I mean, there's just so much of this in my life, this kind of mess. A lot of jars where I'm just levigating a lot of different colors to check them out. And there's more stuff over on the other side. Um, and so I think that's all there is about that. Okay, so over here I have a couple of different samples. So the reasons that I... So, you know, as I started doing this over the past, I would say, five or six years, this is this whole process has kind of evolved into something that I wasn't really expecting, but I really appreciate. So, um, so now it's more than just going out and finding cool colors in the world. It's about um, sort of a deeper process. So, uh, yes, it is. It's exactly the same process. You just add the oil to the dry pigment. So when I'm making the watercolors, um, actually, yeah, I, actually, I forgot to mention that. So this is a glass muller. So when you're going to be making whatever medium that you're going to use, you'll use a glass sheet. I've got a large one, so I don't have it out here right now. And a glass muller, and you'll pour some of the pigment onto the glass sheet along with, what, with whatever vehicle you'll be using to create your material. So if you're using oil paints, you'll put your oils um, and mix those in with the pigment and you you know you use the muller and do like this ooh, this grinding motion to grind the pigment down and then mix it fully into the vehicle um, so for the watercolors I put some pigment down and then I mix in uh, it's a gum arabic and some honey uh, a little bit of clove oil as a preservative and then some distilled water to keep it to keep it moving and then, you know, you just mull. You mull for a while. And that's actually another important part of the process for me is really getting into another level of the pigment itself by just getting into a zone with it and watching how it sort of melts down into the vehicle. And like, you know, it's just kind of like a thing, <laughs> for lack of a really good way to describe it. Um, so anyway, yeah, any, everybody starts with a dry pigment and then use your vehicle of choice, whatever medium you choose to paint in. I do the same with the pastels. Like I have to mull down the pigments into water before I mix those in with the pastel binders to, to make my uh, sticks of pastel. So, okay, so over here, um, these are a few of the samples that I've collected over the past few months. Um, so this particular rock looks completely unassuming. I mean, it's not even interesting at all, but when I, I had a feeling about it, so when I, when I smashed it down and uh, levigated the pigment out, I got this really gorgeous sort of yellow color. It's a little tricky to see right now, but I found this rock um, not far from this house, just down the hill from where I am, in a copse of trees. So there was like some native, there was some sycamore there, maple trees, a couple of oak trees, just all native trees to this region. And that is important to me for the actual watercolor botanical paintings that I do. Um, and I can explain that a little bit further when we get to those. So that was really 
that was really an awesome find recently. Um, so then this particular rock also just looks like kind of a boring gray rock. But um, I recovered this from a creek bed that was recently uh, drained. So a portion of it was drained. And I noticed this rock. It just it stood out to me. It had a really nice, cool gray color to it. It almost had a violet cast. So I picked one up, and I brought it home, smashed it up, and then got this gorgeous, cool shade of gray that does actually... Um, at certain times of the day, throw a little violet. So um, I, I was really kind of liking that, that about it. The interesting thing about this particular rock um, was that when I started to, like I broke it up in the other one that made this. <laughs> I broke this, I broke it up into smaller pieces and I dropped it into the mortar and as I started pounding down on it, like I usually try to be focused on what I'm doing. Like I'm in the moment of pounding down this rock, turning it into a pigment. And I try to be really focused in that moment. And my mind was just somewhere else. I think maybe <laughs> a cat might have been doing something. I don't know, but I was not there. Um, yes. And it does, the mica does come through. I actually just recovered a green. I love when that happens. Sometimes I get natural sparkle from mica and that's just gorgeous. It's such a gift. Um, so I was crushing up this stone, not focused on it. And then all of a sudden I had this intense sensation of like water. Like my mind was just completely all about water. And it, it was like my subconscious mind just brought my conscious mind back into this zone of what I was doing with this rock, I had recovered it from a creek bed and it was submerged in water for such a long time. And so I, I was in that moment for a good while just crushing up the rock. So for this particular shade, um, because this has such a feel of water to it for me, I know exactly what I'm going to use this for. Like I, that can be used for uh, particular pieces that I want to create either to express the element of water or for, I mean, there's a lot of like herons have this color in their, their feathers, you know, this is such a beautiful gray. So for aquatic birds, I'll use that pigment. Um, so for the, in the watercolor pieces that I do. Um, okay, hang on, sip of water. Okay, so this next item here I was really excited about. This is a piece of hematite. This is a soft ore hematite. And I got a tip from a local a uh, couple hours north of here. I was looking for hematite because I love hematite. <laughs> um, hematite has just such a rich history. Like, you know, all the way back in antiquity, hematite was being used as a pigment. Um, the word comes from ancient Greek meaning blood. And so it's like, and I think, was it one of Aristotle's students described it as uh, coagulated blood. So it's sort of like this, this blood of the earth, like this living force that, that's, that's in the earth. Um, so I, I was told about a place where I could find some hematite. And so I went to this place and uh, I found the hematite. But what I wasn't expecting was that it was, the location was on this beautiful hillside uh, covered by trees. So not quite a forest, but it was definitely shaded by a bunch of trees. And there was a 19th century cemetery located there. Completely caught me by surprise. I had no idea it was there. So I had this amazing experience of walking through this old cemetery I looked, I was looking at all of the headstones and just, you know, reading all the names, some of the, some of the epitaphs, just like really just a, a beautiful experience in the woods. And then I kind of mindfully collected a few specimens of this hematite um, to test out, to bring home and test out. And this worked out amazingly well. Like I was so pleased with the shade that I got from this. This actually does have much more of a violet brown sort of cast to and it also does kind of change throughout the day it's like the pigments have such a beautiful um 
interaction with light if you if you let them you know they can it's one of the reasons i love pastel and watercolor so much is that refraction really does play a huge part with the pigment so like light can bounce around these different particles and show you different shades of the pigment particles throughout different times of the day it's just a really interesting kind of quality so so this particular pigment um is is quite complex so for this you know it's not just a simple element it's you know it's like this hematite is like this this life force this blood of the earth but i found it near a cemetery you know where bodies are laid to, to rest so there's this really fascinating sort of complexity for me with this particular pigment so i actually have a few ideas on how i would use that in a couple of pieces as well um can we see the pigment up close yeah let me see if i can get into a better light mm -mm. i mean not sure how to best feel focus. I actually have. Let me see. What can I do? I can pour it into like a little cup. And here. Be easier to see if I so you won't get as much of the the color but that's basically what it looks like when it's all crushed up and I can show you on a sheet of paper I do tests so I'll I'll paint these onto paper to get an idea of what they're actually gonna look like when I use them yeah, the purples are just gorgeous I mean I'll just uh, <laughs> I'll show you I'll try and show some better samples um, of that coming through. So, so yeah, so that was that particular hematite. And so there's this whole sort of experience wrapped up in it, plus this complexity of just place and time. Um, and so that's awesome. And then I, you know, I, I just pulled out, like, this is actually a true hematite. So this is a soft hematite. It's a soft ore. When you have a piece of true hematite, it's got heft to it. It's kind of got some sharp edges. Um, this, this stuff is harder than, than iron. So <laughs> I actually, I, this is what I always try and find out in the wild. I love finding true hematite because you get such a gorgeous shade of red. It has such an incredible clarity to it that you can't really get from synthetic reds or the ochres. Um, but this stuff is so hard. So I have a sheet of, I think it's like AR 500 steel for like target shooting. <laughs> and a five pound hammer and I'll just go to town on these things I mean this is great for like therapy like if you're having a tough day you know smash up some rocks like take it out on a couple of rocks and I, I promise you will feel amazing afterward um so I love finding stuff like this because it's gorgeous um but so I do have let's see so I think this will be a pretty good so these are the colors I've been collecting in Pennsylvania. They are very subtle shades. Um, this is one of the most recent. It's a really gorgeous green. Uh, and then some grays. I'm really into grays right now. I like subtle, subtle hues of gray. Um, <laughs> Smash Rocks, it's awesome. I can't recommend it enough. Um, so let's see, I've actually, I can show you some of the intensity of color. So these are like, this is what I got from Texas. You can get some really incredible colors that's that's a true hematite that is such a gorgeous shade of red i can't even you have to see it in person but that's from some green sand i found alongside of a highway that's a pure yellow ochre um that's a gorgeous shade of a brown hematite um and so i just have like this is my test test book i'll mix i'll mix a lot of these shades in with white gouache just to get you can get a lot of their um, undertones that way so then you really start to see some of the purples come through in some beautiful rose shades again just a gorgeous gorgeous brown um, you know and these are all you just find these out in the world like you know and just process them I process them on my own and make a usable pigment out of them but again I just I'm in love with these colors they're just so beautiful
Especially and especially when they have like when when it comes with a, a sense of time and purpose um, and just like these extra dimensions, it's just it really adds for me uh, to the artworks that I create. Um, so, OK, so anyway, I think that's it's just all going to be more of the same stuff. <laughs> but oh, yeah, so this is one of the good pages. Um, do they have metallic qualities? I think so. If by metallic you mean like a metallic um, finish or sheen to it, I think the closest you would get to like some kind of a metallic finish would be like with the mica. So I get sparkles from mica. Um, and other than that, it's really just most of the finishes are very matte. Um, there's no shine. Yeah, totally sparkly. The mica, it's natural mica in these, a lot of the rocks I recover. Um, so you get just gorgeous little natural sparkles from that. Um, and I really enjoy that. I actually just processed a green that I found not too, like, I think last week that had some natural mica, which surprised me. Um, so I was really ex um, I always love to find mica in my stuff. It's just like, I like when it happens naturally, you know, it just feels like it's sort of like meant, meant to be there. Um, but other than that, I don't really get any other particular qualities with the pigment. Like I said, they're mostly just matte, um, pretty straightforward, and they're, they're, they tend to be quite opaque. So the earth, earth pigments are, tend to be, um, once you start mixing them in, you know, people that paint with, you know, yellow ochres or, or you know, the, the burnt, what is it, burnt umber, I think that's the more orangey one. Um, they tend to be pretty opaque. Um, some of them can be a little bit transparent, like the greens tend to go a, a bit transparent. Um, but I can actually get some control over that when I mix it into the vehicles that I use. Um, so percentage of your time. Pigment prep versus painting. Well, um, you know, I would say. So pigment prep is, is an interesting thing. It, I put the time into it. Like I said, I like to be there with it in that moment. I don't, I don't like to just do it while I'm doing other things. When it's, you know, when I'm smashing up the rocks, I'm there with it. It usually takes, I would say, uh, maybe 20 minutes to smash up enough rock um, to levigate in the water. When I levigate the pigment and then I let the pigment settle in the dish, that just happens. I just set it aside and wait for it to settle. Um, then I'll spend time again, uh, uh, not really so much smashing it before I bottle it, but mulling. Mulling usually takes, depending on the pigment, it can take anywhere from like a half an hour to an hour. So that's like, so another hour, hour and 20 minutes for uh, pigment processing. So overall, it really doesn't take a lot of time work-wise. Um, it's a lot of patience. So it's not something that you're going to be like, <laughs> you're not going to go out and collect some rocks and have paint the next day. Like you just... And to me, that's actually one of the really enjoyable aspects of this. I love, I love waiting for things. You know, I really like having that, that payoff at the end after I've, I've put so much work into something. So painting time definitely takes a lot longer. <laughs> so in my large watercolors, like there's probably at least a hundred hours going into each one of those. I am super super detailed, like just completely OCD about the details that I'm painting. I use super fine brushes. So for sure, the most amount of time goes into the paintings. Um, pastels don't take as much time because I'm not using such tiny brushes, but those require more time like over like the trajectory because there's a different sort of thing going into those. But yeah, with the watercolors, I work on those. I'll start a painting and work on it every day for a few hours a day for, you know, a couple of weeks, a few weeks. Um, so how am I doing for time? There's like no time on here. I have no idea what's happening in the world. So basically that's all the, the pigment part of this. Um, oh, so I didn't have, I wanted to show you um, some of the paints that I made, but I, <laughs> I've used them all. Like I burned through a bunch of them over the past couple of weeks, just creating some stuff. These are some of the pastels I've made though. These are gorgeous to use. I mean, the application is just incredible. This is a really nice violet here. Okay, 
So I've only been doing this for 13 minutes, or I have 13 minutes left. I think it's only been 13 minutes. Um, but I will be, I'm doing another live, Facebook live next week on Friday, I think at 2 p.m. for the actual virtual show for Rittenhouse. So I will have some actual prepared paints that I can show off then. Um, I'll, I'll be able to make them over the weekend. Mull oh, 13 remaining. Wow. Okay. So mulling, mulling the paints is not something that I like to rush through at all. I, I need to set a time, uh, set aside a time and space to do it properly. Um, so I didn't want to rush that just to have something to show today. So, okay. So anyway, so we'll go on to the other thing I wanted to sort of discuss with the, you know, so I paint these, these kind of large, um, watercolor paintings. I think this one is like, I want to say 22 by 14 or something like that. Um, and I do get quite detailed, um, with what I'm doing. And so the purpose of these works is to, um, educate people. I wanted to, um, I, I love, you know, the, the native flora and fauna in the region, anywhere I live, I just always take an interest in the natives that grow there and thrive there. And, you know, with the, the eco issues that we're having right now, um, I really wanted to do something with my work that could sort of help try and stem some of the destruction that's going on with the environment. And so I have just, just such an incredible love for plants and insects and birds. So I wanted to create works, botanical works. This is sort of a distillation down from larger pieces that I was doing of like ecosystems surrounding a tree. I wanted to create simpler images um, that illustrated an insect or a bird with its companion plant. So trying to just make simple images that would help people identify and then match these organisms together. So this particular butterfly uses this particular violet as a host plant. Um, and so, you know, the same that I have over here with the monarch, it's the milkweed. And that's actually more of like a life cycle um, painting. But generally, I, you know, I use the work to let people know that these organisms go together. I focus a lot on endangered or threatened species to try and shine a light on those. Um, and I do an enormous amount of research on these. So I would say 50% of the work I do with the actual paintings is research. So I go online or I have books and I research all of the information about these organisms. And then I, you know, I, I keep track of it. I record it and I share it with people. So I use the work to sort of um, just share information, you know, just let people know what's going on um, in the environment, encourage them to um, garden with native plants, you know, so you can attract native insects. Um, this particular fritillary is gorgeous. Uh, this is native to the area and I'm actually growing these violets in my yard right now. They're freaking beautiful. Um, I've done some bees. Uh, these are all native bees. This, this actual bumblebee was, I think, the first insect on the, the federal endangered species list. Um, and, you know, they, they use the aster for, uh, food plant. They're pollinators. So I'm, I'm, you know, I'm just telling people about, you know, the important pollinators in the world. And, um... Yeah, basically just using the work. That was my whole intent for, for this. The, the work is still sort of evolving, but my intention was just to kind of, you know, if I'm going to be out in the world doing shows and engaging people, I wanted to show them, you know, some things that are, that, that get their attention and then also share information with them about, uh, you know, how they can, you know, grow these plants, conserve the species, protect you know, whatever they can do in their own yards to try and to try and help out. Um, so the work is evolving. I'll talk more about this next week. Um, this is a work in progress. I actually have a series of bluebells, Virginia bluebells with bumblebees, early season bumblebees that I'm pretty excited about. I'm mounting these on wood panels now, which I really, really like. Um, and then that evolved into something completely different. This is a new project for this year. I will talk more about this next week. Um, this is a, an actual 
as you can tell, a piece of wood <laughs> that has not been finished for any particular use, but this was part of my idea. Um, and this is a piece of scarlet oak. Uh, and then when I talk about that next week, I'll, I'll go back and mention more about the rock that I found around the sycamore and maple and oak trees because that really plays an important part. It's like the, the this particular pigment from this rock with this particular tree, with the organisms that I'm painting on there. Um, and so, yeah, I'll go more into that next week because I'm gonna run out of time fast. Uh, what do I use to mount on the wood block? I, let's see, so I this was a crazy process. Um, I experimented with everything. So I use the um, gel medium by, I think golden is the stuff I have right now. Golden gel medium, I used the gloss. Um, the research that I did actually indicated, I actually talked to um, a couple of people at Golden that recommended um, using, people are using the medium, it has not been tested for a long period of time. So you, you definitely want to seal the wood first because you don't want the moisture from the medium leaching any of the acids from the wood and then transferring that to the paper. So I picked up um, uh, an eco-friendly sealer, wood sealer that's made with juniper. Um, and I sealed the wood first, it's waterproof seal. And then I put down one coat of the gloss gel medium um, let that dry and then I put a second coat down just to make sure I had a good barrier between the wood and the paper um, And then I put the third coat down and, and glued the paper on so I glued the paper on before I actually painted um, So I'm mounting before painting with these although I might I might do some painting and then mounting but that was an experiment I wanted to see how the the the, um, the paper would take the paint after mounting it and I was it was all right You know, it's not too bad that like I said that piece isn't finished yet but I think it'll turn out just fine. I'm, I'm getting some nice, you know, granulation. I like the effects I'm getting with the paints that I'm using, so. Um, so yeah, so that's that. I don't know if there was anything else I needed to um, mention, like I made notes, but how am I looking for time? <laughs> I think I can probably just wrap this up for now and talk about more um, next week. Yeah, you can paint after mounting. I know a lot of people like to paint before mounting, and I think that's fine too. Um, I haven't actually done that yet, but I'll probably try that in another few weeks. Um, so anyway, so yeah, so that's basically I mean, the stuff that goes, those are the behind the scenes. That's like... A lot of the work that goes into each one of these paintings that I do um, before, you know, they actually get done. Like there's all this process leading up to it and I just feel like it really energizes the work that I, that I create. You know, there's, there's so much that goes into each one and just really kind of ties me to um, the piece. You're welcome. Um, the, the Gorilla Glue. I mean, if you're talking about like Gorilla Glue, I would, I would not use that. You want to use a glue that is safe for art. So it's got to be archival. It's got to be acid free. It's got to have a lot of that stuff that's required for, you know, artwork, especially paper. I mean, paper, you know, you have to be careful with papers. You have to make sure that whatever comes in contact with the paper is not going to cause it to deteriorate, you know, anytime in the future. Um, so next next week, I think it's Friday, Friday at 2 p.m. Um, I gotta double check. Pretty sure it's a Friday at, Friday at 2 p.m. I can put it down in the comments. I'll post it on my my Facebook page and then on I can post in the comments for this video on the the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show page. Um, but yeah, so thank you to everyone for tuning in and. Um, uh, thank you to Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show again for, for granting me this opportunity. I'll be here again, like I said, next week talking about some more stuff. I'll probably do a quick overview of this and then go, go more into the newer projects that I'm working on right now. Um, and yeah, so I think that's about it. Unless there were any other questions, I think we're good to go. All 
right, awesome. Thank you so much. And maybe I'll catch you guys uh, later in this week. Definitely, the, the virtual show for Rittenhouse is taking place next weekend. Um, you know, lots of Friday at 2 p.m., right? <laughs> yes, there we go. Um, there's going to be a lot of stuff going on in the Rittenhouse Square Fine Art Show page with the virtual um, art show taking place. So, yeah, I'll see you guys all next week. Thank you so much, and have a great weekend.